Today on the show, I'm happy to have Josh Penner. He's the founder and CEO of Inquisio AI. They're leveraging emerging AI models to make the government better. The best products and businesses come from a founder who's been mulling it over for a decade. And now they have a full picture of, okay, this is the problem we really need to solve. And then that's your 20 year overnight success situation. We all exist in kind of this bias where we see the Mark Zuckerbergs or Steve Jobs, who we don't know their background, but when you look into their background, even they had their 10,000 hours of learning, but we see what looks like overnight success. And so we assume that's what success should look like for us. But when you dig deep and that in most cases, people who are successful really understand the problem that they're trying to solve more so than they understand the solution. Most of these people aren't the programmers of the end solution. They know enough to get it forward and to pull a team around them. And so really get to know the problem is, would be my suggestion to my earlier self. Yeah. I think that's a great tip. Yeah. If you can really diagnose that problem, then you can start finding the people who can help you build that solution. Recently, there was a bit of an inflection point where they figured out that multilingual interaction with the tools they were creating was an extreme point of value for the municipalities that they're dealing with. Josh, how did this come about? One of the aspects of the tools that we're building is the ability to interact with things like municipal code or critical documents at a city or, sorry about that, at a city or a local jurisdiction. And we were querying our models and we were talking to a, a potential client who has 30% non-English speaking community. And we thought, what the heck, let's take a look and see how this works out. And this wasn't something that we designed into it. And so part of our solution is utilizing some large language models that are now becoming consumerized, of course. And lo and behold, that our tool was able to create that kind of end point interaction where someone who's monolingual, non-English can engage with our tools, the same as somebody who has a college degree or somebody that's got a fifth grade education. So we are really aiming for, uh, we weren't aiming for this kind of multilingual uh, interaction. But when it occurred, it just became a really fascinating way to position our tool in a way that other tools in this market don't exist. And yeah, we're really excited about the gap demonstration there, the gap of capabilities, but it's, it's been, uh, it's been really interesting. We thought we were solving one problem and we've discovered another problem and solved it at the same time. So you're going full pivot and just going into this new problem. I would say it's open up the conversation and our goal has always been to develop a tool that enables anyone to access their government better. And when we're saying government, we say small G government. This is cities, counties, fire districts, school districts, not the federal government. But our goal has always been to solve some of the problems that are huge in this particular industry and for the benefit of constituents like us, like you, like me. And this solves another problem, but it opens up what we call a gap. And so in our industry, price sensitivity isn't as strong as service gap sensitivity. And so if you come in 5% cheaper than the other person is doing the exact same thing, you're likely not to get anyone to shift who they're getting provided from. But if you demonstrate a huge gap, such as our tools can now engage with a section of the populace that previously heretofore hasn't been uh, engaged with, we really, that drives, that drives progress. So is this, because you're dealing with government as clients, are you still having to deal with a bid type of structure where you have to put in a bid to win the contract? Potentially. One of our key strategic advantages in our company is that we come from government. I'm the mayor of a city of about 10,000 people. Our team is marinated in local government. And so we understand the process very well. And strategy is to try to avoid purchasing decisions that require a legislative action. And that I think is traditionally the enterprise model coming into government technology sector is you have hundred thousand dollars a year, usually tri trips the, uh, the legislative requirement for a council or alderman or whatever it is in your jurisdiction to give the authorization. So as long as we come in at that administrative authority level, we think that we can speed up that process quite a bit. So that means if you're below a hundred thousand, you can come in at that level. It I'm giving 100,000 because it's a nice round number, but yeah, wherever you live, whatever jurisdiction that you're part of, and you're probably part of multiple, you've got a city, a county, a school district, you're part of multiple jurisdictions. There's some threshold 
that somebody is going to be able to spend just to do daily business. So surely you don't need a council to approve a $50 a month Dropbox subscription, but you would need the council to approve a $100,000 a year SaaS platform or customer relationship software or something like that. So what brought you into, from being the mayor of a city, what brought you into the AI yeah. field? Oh, I've been in business on my own for a number of years. I'd say probably the last 13 years at this point, success and not success. And uh, through my own personal education, I've been interested in machine learning for optimization, for analysis and those sorts of things. And the last couple of years, you've seen this kind of shift towards a consumer application of not just machine learning, but AI. AI is an umbrella term that captures a bunch of different subjects. And I've always been fascinated thinking that there's a lot of applications of machine learning in the public sector space, but I've never really had the, I never could figure out the intersection. And I'd say last year I had a thought that struck me out of the blue and thought that the biggest issue that we have in this space, which is the ability to have contextual understanding and of records that solves so many downline problems. That is really the critical place in this space is solving what we call the public records issue. And a lot of the, a lot of the models that exist in the market go a long way towards helping us do that. And we utilized some of that machine learning tinkering around for years to build up demonstration models to say, look, we can actually do some really interesting things here. And so that's where this came from was an intersection of two passions. And I know a lot of times with working with entities like this, it's the adoption, the speed at which you can get it adopted. So this is your strategy now for cutting through that red tape, staying below those thresholds? Partially. So stay below the thresholds as part of the strategy. You, when you start thinking about strategy, once upon a time, I even wrote a book on this. You're talking about what are those things that you can do now that are going to be hard for somebody else to do for various reasons. And one of them, of course, is to have a pricing strategy or go to market strategy. The other is when you sit in an industry, what are going to be the, what are going to be the things that are going to be antagonistic towards your revenue model or your ability to continue doing business? So you think about Netflix, you think originally their strategy was to compete with Blockbuster, but in reality, their strategy was to, the long-term strategy was to eliminate brokers in the market like Blockbuster and basically be their own entertainment producer and sell directly to consumers. And they redefine the market by doing that, by eliminating brokers. So their strategy was superior to blockbusters because they could make a move on blockbuster that blockbuster couldn't respond to. And our perspective is there's people in this industry, but their strategy is inferior to ours for a number of different reasons. And they have the presence in the market, but they don't solve the problem. And we don't believe that the problem they're trying to solve is the problem that needs to be solved. We've redefined the problem and without giving, tipping our hat too much. I think we've got a great angle on this. When you redefine the problem, then you have to convince them that this is the new problem. What have you well, seen along yeah. those lines? If everybody agrees that the problem is the same, then you're talking about a race to the bottom with, with pricing. But if the problem they're trying to solve, if they've solved their problem and it's not solving our problem in government. And so clearly the problem description is different. We believe we have a better description of the problem and it demonstrates a service gap. And when I said that our industry is really resistant to price sensitivity, it's very, it's really motivated by gap sensitivity. Meaning if you're not able to do something that other jurisdictions can do, then all of a sudden you become problematic. If every other jurisdiction can communicate in multilingual, in a multilingual way. You can hold out for a while in doing it, but at some point there's going to be some higher level of regulation that's going to force you to do it. And your current vendor is not going to be able to do it at that point. That gap problem, that gap of the gap issue becomes much more important than the price sensitivity issue, if that makes sense. It does, because you have to speak to all your constituents and exactly. you say that to any politician, they understand that. It's a huge opportunity to bring government closer to constituents, but also for those that are making rules or living in rules to be able to understand what it is that they have to vote on or to digest quicker. At any point in time, you've got council members or legislators, a 500 page packet that they've skimmed, but don't have the depth of knowledge on. And so if you're able to solve the public records tool or public records issue, 
It means that you're able to digest documents and have a contextual understanding and be able to produce those for unknown queries at request. Same, you, you now have a policy development tool that is super powerful that can enable you on your first day in office to ask really in-depth questions, almost as if you have a staff working for you that you otherwise would need to really just marinate in the topics for a couple of years and to be able to ask really good questions and push forward good policy. Now, along the lines of asking really good questions, for those problem-solving entrepreneurs out there who are thinking about starting their first business, what's your advice to them? I think it's important to think about the problem. We touched on that a little bit, but I also think it's important to get out there and test whatever solution you have. Your solution is probably not going to be correct 100% right away, but you can pivot. I think we mentioned that word earlier, maybe pre-air, but you can pivot. Uh, you don't have to get locked into things. In fact, it's easier when you're not making money to pivot. Once you're starting to make money, it becomes quite a bit more complicated to pivot. Don't be afraid of screwing up. Get out there with your solution and see if there's a market for it. If you could tell your younger self any one thing, what would it be? Be patient. I've wanted to build something for decades at this point. There's a quote that rattles around in my brain. It's a, it took me 20 years to be an overnight success. I'm not claiming to be an overnight success, but this idea has had success, quite a bit of success already. And it's not because I just thought of it without any background industry knowledge or anything. It's, it is, it is decades of industry knowledge. It is tinkering around at night and going back to school and working through those relationships. It's building relationships with people around me that we can bring in as co-founders that can fill in the gaps. So that way it's not me doing a hundred percent of everything. And that stuff required years of just thinking about how to do things. Also years of, I'd say, getting along with solopreneur work. Yeah. So Josh, if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you or your company to learn more, how could they do? Two ways. You can learn more about our company, inquisio.ai. So I-N-Q-U-I-S-I-O.ai. And if you want to get in touch with me personally, I'm very active on LinkedIn. There's a lot of Joshua Penners. They're all fantastic, I'm sure, but I'm the one that is the mayor of Ording and the CEO of Inquisio AI. So come take a look. Thank you, Josh, for coming on the show. Absolutely. And thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. Make sure to smash that subscribe button. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki with Cosmic Web Design and Development, and we'll see you next time.